projects. The city of Pripyat, next to the Chernobyl reactors, was a rare modern city of urban conveniences in an otherwise poor, rural Ukrainian landscape. After the Fukushima disaster, press reports described how Japanese power companies, though they skimped on safety, amply subsidized American-inspired nuclear villages and sold nuclear power with visions of middle-class prosperity. I wondered about this enduring connection between nuclear power and high-risk affluence. Azersk and Richland were government-owned and managed by corporate bosses. Richland was unusual on the American landscape because it had no private property, no free market or local self-government. Azersk was one of ten nuclear cities in the Soviet Union that existed secretly, off the map, behind fencing. Every resident required a special pass to live there. Strangely, residents appeared to like these restrictive arrangements. In Richland in the 1950s, voters in two separate elections turned down incorporation, self-government, and free enterprise. In Ozersk in the late 1990s, 95% of voters polled wished to keep their city's gates, guards, and pass system. At this writing, Ozersk remains in a state of incarceration, fenced and guarded. I wondered about these choices. Why did residents of these plutonium cities choose to give up their civil and political rights? Soviet citizens had no electoral politics, no independent media, but the residents of Richland lived in a thriving democracy. Why did the famed checks and balances fail to the extent that a calamity surpassing Chernobyl occurred in America's heartland? These are the questions that drove this book. In answering them, I found that to entice workers to agree to the risks and sacrifices involved in plutonium production, American and Soviet nuclear leaders created something new, Plutopia. Plutopia's unique, limited-access, aspirational communities satisfied most desires of American and Soviet post-war societies. The orderly prosperity of Plutopia led most eyewitnesses to overlook the radioactive waste mounting around them. This is the first book to narrate in tandem the history of the plutonium disasters in the United States and the Soviet Union. After this book, I hope it will no longer make sense to tell the two histories separately. People in Ozersk used to say that if you drilled a hole straight through the earth, you would end up in Richland. That is how I imagine the two cities, orbiting each other, linked on the same axis. Richland and Ozersk were made in each other's image, deliberately, as I will show, through the careful footwork of intelligence agents and community boosters who feared the end of plutonium production nearly as much as they feared the nuclear rival. The narrative is told in four stages. Parts 1 and 2, Telescope on Eastern Washington from 1943 and the Southern Urals from 1946, as migrant workers, prisoners, and soldiers put up colossal plutonium plants. Initially, American and Soviet leaders planned to produce plutonium with militarized labor in army camp settings. Horrified, however, at the boozing, brawling construction workers— American and Soviet plant managers quickly changed their minds. Operators of the world's first plutonium plants, they realized, could not be as volatile as the product they made. The answer to disorderly, violent migrant workers, unhinged from family and community, was to embed plutonium operators safely within nuclear families living in well-heeled, exclusive atomic cities. Americans called Richland a village, recalling the mythical pastoral roots of American democracy. Soviets called Ozersk.